so much everybody for coming to this session and um, it's my pleasure to round off um, the presentation part and hopefully we'll move on to discussion in a second. Um, I feel so thankful to have just been in this room this afternoon and I feel like it's been a really great experience. So my slightly woolly title came about because I kind of had a feeling this was going to happen. I thought there are loads of really brilliant people in this room and I hope by the end of the afternoon we can all kind of part as brilliant friends belonging to each other. So, right, um, down to business. I want to start with two stories. Um, many years ago, I came to my first tag in Durham in the snow. I went to all the lectures, I went to everything. I sat there like a little baby rabbit, listening and taking it all in and feeling wonderful. And like this was the beginning of a great career, potentially. Then I went to the tag party and I tried to talk to somebody about their paper. And they went like this. And they said, I love your necklace. And I went home and I felt a bit crap. And then when I got home to the student digs, that um, a crash space, so you basically sent an email and somebody said, oh yeah, they can sleep on my floor. Um, the piece of floor, I'd actually been given a bed. How exciting was that? I had laid out my bed linen on this bed and then suddenly there was another eminent man already in there with another student. Um, I had to go in and get my bits and bobs. Um, contact lens wearer, non-negotiable. I'm not getting conjunctivitis on top of everything else. Um, Every time I see this man, and I do see him, I feel so skittish and I feel so uncomfortable. But that is nothing to what that other student probably feels. I mean, they're not still together. However we frame that, it's pretty uncomfortable. So first story, really minor. I really hope that's not going to be anybody's experience of tag um, this, this week. My second story is also kind of quite minor, but it's from this year. It's very recent. It's a bit raw. Um, I was asked to review three books in two different languages, um, neither of which were English, as a favour. Um, I'd like to think I've got the language skills, hard earned, so I agreed. Um, two were easy. They were great. Um, I really enjoyed reading them. One was harder. I was as generous and kind as I know how to be. Then the review was published, and a few months later, the uh, testerical, I'm not saying hysterical, testerical, <laughs> raging email came. He threatened to end my career. Um, I don't have one, so no worries there. Um, he warned he would set his friends on me. Did I know his very famous friend who would be very upset to hear about this? Um, the name dropping. The journal were very supportive of me. I obviously sent it straight to them, um, and then he... He didn't react to that terribly well. Um, and another journal, really recently, I only found this out a couple of weeks ago, it's actually helped him carry out his threat. And uh, I doubt I will ever be able to publish in that journal again, which is the major English language publication for my subdiscipline. So that's great, isn't it? And apart from that, I'm, I'm working on another review and all I can feel is anxiety. I'm so worried and I'm so gaslit as I, as I work on this current review. These are two really quite minor stories and I was worried about presenting them almost because they pale in comparison to some of the things that I've heard. Um, but actually, when I put them together with the list of other things that I've experienced working in this discipline and against the background of all the other stories that I have heard, I think every woman that I've ever spoken to in this discipline has a range of stories. I just feel sick. I'm sickened by it. And the efforts to stop these kind of experiences from happening to protect archaeologists at all levels of the profession are part of what have brought us all here today. I hope they're having an impact, but we have also already seen a backlash, whether it's discussion or of who should wear a respect badge and, um, and groups feeling excluded from the conversation and kind of lashing out. And I'm also really, really sick of hearing another kind of story, something that I believe is closely linked to the behaviour that's meted out daily in the present. I am sick and tired of seeing, seeing and hearing the same old stories told about women's lives in the past. So, this is Ati. Um, I mean, I'm calling her this, they're not calling her this. She's the Etruscan Barbie. She's got the figure and the doe eyes of a Disney princess. She's got the CGI enhanced boobs of Lara Croft. And she is the avatar for one of the most impressive collections of Etruscan material in the world. And she's being rolled out into other smaller museums. This, if you're um, a child encountering Etruscan archeology span for the first time, this is the face that you're gonna see. And we've seen academic studies on how harmful, um, inappropriate, Barbie or Disney princess style bodies can be. Why is this seeping through into archaeology? It's so exhausting. 
Um, we see this, this kind of one-dimensional interpretation again and again in my specialism, Etruscan archaeology and elsewhere. So the excavation of a rich burial that was termed the tomb of the golden scarabs was described by the archaeologists as belonging to a bambina principessa. Um, so that was largely translated by the English-speaking um, science press as baby princess, which is a slight mistranslation, but um, it's a, still a really icky image. Um, and any female who does not fit, fit this kind of princess narrative gets very quickly shoved back in her box. So the image on the right is from the excavation of the tomb of the hanging Arabalus at Tarquinia. When archaeologists describe the discovery first, so on these, um, on these plinths we've got two burials and both of them were buried with weapons. So you can guess what came next. They're two warriors, they're buried with weaponry. Then when the osseoarchaeological analysis came back and one was revealed to be female, um, they had a problem. Woman warrior, don't be daft. The spearhead was clearly just a symbol of unity with her husband. And the single word used to sum up this clearly fabulously complex individual's life, oh, just another spinster. Literally, the word spinster was what was used in, in, a, in a journal. Um, oh. Now, looking out from archaeology, I think one of the reasons we're here, I think we'd all agree, there's been this huge upswelling in engagement in feminist thought and activism. And what I want to argue is that a huge amount of its strength has been drawn from stories from life, from real experiences, from testimonies that have been shared and built into a huge and powerful body of evidence that can no longer be ignored. Um, so one of, the, one of the earlier ones, something that I encountered quite early, is Everyday Sexism Project, started in 2011 in the UK. Yeah, Alwyn, I'm really cross. Um, it's a huge resource which is still growing every day. But I think... I think we'd also probably agree that the real change in pace and the breakthrough came with the emergence of Tarana Burke's Me Too onto the hashtag Me Too onto the world stage. I can't believe it's only a year ago. How much has changed? Although Burke herself had been leading this movement for many years and prior to its explosion, when the hashtag became a global talking point and be a byword for a phenomenon. You listen to Radio 4, everyone knows what hashtag Me Too is, even bloody John Humphreys knows. <laughs> I gave a very early incarnation of this paper, and I wrote it up. It's, been, it's in the Archipress shop, um, but don't buy it, it's very expensive, um, just before Me Too broke. And I was already really angry. I was full of fury and frustration, and then suddenly along came Me Too, and every woman I knew was talking about their own rage and their own experiences. The power of this movement came from the volume of stories, their obvious veracity and their rootedness in experiences which were instantly familiar and recognisable. Every tweet with that hashtag felt like a microbiography. So the latest wave of feminist action, um, I mean, where are we now? Are we on uh, fourth wave, fifth wave? Can post-feminism count as a wave? Six? I don't know. I'm being flippant, but um, quite serious there. And it's entirely biographical. A quick word, one of the many criticisms, and I think rightful criticisms, of hashtag Me Too, is that it became very quickly um, associated with cultural appropriation. So the years of work and activism of a woman of colour were erased and elided in largely white representation of the story. And the debt owed to the labour of women of colour for moving feminism onwards remains largely unacknowledged. And while it completely underpins this biographical turn, I think, um, as Enrique was saying, we find the origins for this in the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, whose concept of intersectionality is front and centre in this session. And I think it's, um, I'm going to front up and say this now, I've, I've been worrying about this for weeks. I'm really, that's the one thing I'm disappointed about in this session. I'm disappointed in myself that I haven't been able to include uh, somebody, the, the opinions and the thoughts of somebody from... Um, from a different ethnic background. Like I feel we were talking about how this is not for white middle class women, and yet I feel like I'm very much a white middle class woman. And so are many of the other speakers. And that's something hopefully when we come back, if we do another feminist archaeology session, hopefully we can be more inclusive and work harder to, to help pe people to share their views. So before Me Too went viral, um, there were a large number of amazing scholars doing great work. And it's been so good. One of the things that made me really happy this afternoon is we've been able to see people self cross-referencing each other. So the same 
I, I guess it's coming to be the usual suspects, but they're all really great. And they're all, I think, largely rooted in the power of biography. So trailblazers, and they obviously began focused on biographies of pioneering women. And now I think it's fair to say they've expanded into an empire. And I'm really excited <laughs> to hear about where they're going to go in the future. British women in archaeology, I think we all owe Rachel and Anne a huge debt for carrying on and fighting for yeah, women in British yeah, archaeology, yeah, yeah, yeah. even when young women like me were swept away by the nonsense of the post-feminist dream. <laughs> to my shame, I can remember saying to Yvonne Marshall that we didn't need feminism anymore. What a difference <laughs> 10 years make, eh? Um, the work of Rachel and Anne has been enormous. Emotional, physical and academic labour. Um, Rachel's brave and bold paper calling out the sexist bullshit at the heart of the academy has inspired a generation. And then, of course, those documenting the deep and the dark effects of the bullshit, the lives ruined, the careers snuffed out. American anthropologist Kate Clancy's su surveying of the fieldwork focused disciplines, the gathering of data, um, the development of safeguards, the witnessing, the legal work. Sarah Perry, um, who's a kind of somebody I really admire and have worked with, taking it online, revealing the extent of harassment that happens outside the trench and reaches into the device in your own pocket. <laughs> Teresa and the Enabled Archaeology Foundation doing remarkable work. Um, that's our activism. That's where we are. And these are the people we owe our debts to. And we can talk about how to push that forward. But at the same time, I think we can't leave behind our practice and our identity as archaeologists. The narratives that we construct are interpretations of material culture, environmental evidence, all the different kinds of archaeological data. These two can benefit from the power of biography. And just as what I'm going to call the biographical turn has revitalized feminist activism, I think it can revitalize some of the tired tropes I was moaning about at the beginning. And I've been moaning about them for almost a decade in my subdiscipline. And I bet if you if you've been working in that kind of subdiscipline, you have too. So the first thing to say is that archaeologists have already engaged with biography as a concept in a number of different ways. And I think they've done so really very well. Um, obviously, Chris Gosden, Yvonne Marshall's development of object biography as a concept took hold. It, it kind of caught people's attention. It caught on. And I don't think enough credit is given to Jody Joy for his careful refinement of the concept and his recognition that actually as archaeologists, we tend to still revert to doing what we've always done, to talk about production or deposition, or be it calling it birth and death, and ignoring or kind of blurring the long and fuzzy, messy time of an object's use that lies in the middle. Laurie Wilkie's work on the life of Lucretia Perryman showed the potential for historical archaeology as biography, using the contents of a well to argue for Perryman's careful negotiation of the line between the medicalization of birth and the regular regulation of midwives in 19th century Mobile, Alabama, and also the folk beliefs and the traditional knowledge that her patients trusted. Blue glass bottles spoke to the latter, patent medicine bottles to the former. And that is really a tiny taste of an inspirational study. I would have, go and read it. It's great. Of course, Janet Spector, we had a Joan Giro shout out earlier. Um, Janet Spector, pioneering feminist archaeologist, one half of the Conkey Inspector powerhouse paper that helped put us all in this room. What this all means is a painstaking exploration of a single artifact's journey through the life of a Wapiton Dakota woman. So yeah, we are already using biography in a huge range of ways. We've got this. Now, what does a trendy, I promise she wasn't this trendy when I started this project, um, Italian novelist have to offer to archaeology? The rest of this paper is going to argue that Elena Ferrante offers a huge amount. The Neapolitan novels from which I've drawn much of my inspiration focus on the lives of two young girls growing up in the slums of Naples, Elena Greco and her best friend Lila. Elena, the protagonist, while always presented um, in her own words as kind of the lesser intellect, manages to reach university and begin the project of transforming her life. But Lila is trapped in a violent marriage and her attempts to escape from this and then to rally fellow sausage factory workers result in personal tragedy. Ferrante's writing is an ardently feminist project. Through Elena's eyes and Lella's suffering, we see the injustice of patriarchal society inscribed on the lives and bodies of two young girls from earliest childhood. And there are three features of Ferrante's writing that I think are really important to our project of reconstructing past lives and stories. The first point is that the seemingly ordinary lives of unprivileged people are filled with complexity and meaning. Those who are marginalized through their gender, race, age, and social status experience great drama in their lives and are worthy of the artist, the writer, and indeed the archaeologist. 
That drama is not defined by these identities, although individual identities may come to be defined by the unfolding drama of life. The second point is that these collisions and the crash site of a person is created largely through experiences. While clearly genetic inheritance is central in the development of the physical body, even genes can be remade and remodeled. The increasing understanding of phenotypes and epigenetics recognizes that experiences shape the genes we inherit and those we pass on. In Ferrante's work, we see that Lila and Elena come from the same street with the same background. The categories of identity focused upon by archaeologists um, and that's a discussion I'd love to go into in more detail, how we tend to just categorise and we sort of stick in these silos. We don't kind of talk to one another. Um, and intersectional feminists alike are shared by both women. It's not these underlying factors that we might define from um, very, very broadly, which structure their lives as young girls and adult women. It's their experiences, their reactions and the relationships that bring them together and tear them apart. It's perhaps these shared and repeated experiences that we may most straightforwardly approach archaeologically. However, the multiplicity of viewpoints bound up in a single experience is important to bear in mind. The perspective of different mourners at a funeral, for example, or different guests at a banquet is based on individual reactions and relationships that weave together into a thick web of shared experience. The third point is that objects and places are central to the creation and constitution of these experiences. Indeed, objects and places have the power to influence and structure experiences, identities, and whole lives. In Ferrante's novels, it's often objects and what happens to them that dictate future, future plot points. So the beautiful pair of shoes that Lila makes and designs, which then appear on the feet of her enemy, signal the betrayal and ending of all her girlhood dreams. But they're more than a symbol. It's the physical act, the trading of the shoes, that alienates Lila from her husband, and it destroys their marriage before it's even begun. A simple movement, two shoes walking down the street, two lives changed. Coming around full circle and back to taking action, Ferrante offers us ideas on activism too. As the Italian literature scholar Tessa Brown has very recently, I mean two days ago, observed, Ferrante's novels take place against the struggle of right and left in mid-20th century Italy, with fascist sympathisers um, implied as linked with the Camorra, ominously present in the streets, and a violent presence in Lila and Elena's lives. As Brown points out, Ferrante's solution to fascism partly lies in feminist organisation, glimpses of what can happen when women take responsibility for each other. I really hope that's what we're here to do today um, with male allies as well. So um, I'd like to have gone into archaeological applications of Ferrante's work in more detail, but you can read about that in the article which accompanies this paper, which should be out in the spring, hopefully. What we need to do now is start recognising and taking on those responsibilities to each other, a task that's already underway, but which really needs your support every day, just as Teresa was saying, calling it out, doing the work, to flourish. It's clear that biography has the potential to power change. We've seen what it can do to organise and inspire activism, to challenge sexism, transforming lives in the present. And I believe it can do the same for the androcentric and sexist narratives still being plastered onto the lives of women in the past. Recognising complexity, experiential perspectives, and the formative role of things and places. These three principles are, at the tri are the triad at the heart of Ferrante's biographical feminism, and they are all deeply relevant to archaeological practice. Combine them with her ideas of women supporting women, and let's get to work. <laughs>